What is going on, investors? Hopefully, you guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is Friday, and I know you've been waiting all day for the Fang Stock Recap Show here on the Investor Channel, where every Friday we recap all the major news and the technical chart patterns from all the major Fang Stocks, including Apple, which announced a, a slew of products this week. We'll get to all of that news and more, but we start things off like we always do with Meta Platforms. Start of the week much lower at $160 per share. This one's trading in such a beautiful technical pattern. You should be making money with your your trades on Meta as it ended the week closer to $169 per share. That's up over 5%. Now, there's an antitrust bill, which we've talked about here on the channel, that appears to be stalling with the tech industry really piling money into these ads. Senator Amy Klobuchar, which is one of the co-sponsors of the bill, I believe this guy does have some bipartisan support, at least from a sponsorship perspective. She's saying is what has slowed us down in terms of passing this bill is the incredible onslaught of money money. And that is what happens with monopolies. I don't know if I re really agree with that last part. She might have a point there, but what it happens with these big tech companies, it's not necessarily just these big tech companies, corporates in general, especially in election year, what these companies are doing is they're running a slew of ads to the opposition in these senators home states. And so obviously it's cooled the support for a bill like this money talks and politicians walk when it comes to these types of things. This is what we talk about so much here on the channel, that there is a lot of noise out of Washington, D.C., but I would not pay attention to a lot of that noise until that bill is physically on a president's desk and he or she signs that bill because these companies can buy their way out of lots of issues. Instagram is cutting back on their shopping amb ambitions amid more ad-driven focus. I think really the thing to focus on here is Instagram or Facebook or Meta is, is really refining their strategy. So it looked like they might have been going like full-blown e-commerce, like maybe like a Shopify type of situation or like a Facebook marketplace type of situation. What they're doing is kind of refining it a little bit, not allowing you to maybe go in that direction, still focusing on ads. I actually like that. I do like the fact that Instagram or Meta kind of experimented here, but that the fact that they have the courage to refine it and maybe get back to their roots a little bit, that online advertising. It could also mean that online advertising is getting a little bit better over at Meta. The trends are getting a little bit better. So there tend to be maybe a focus on it a little bit more than maybe in years past. Now, Meta Platform sets an October 11th date for a virtual Metaverse conference. So not, not much known about this other than maybe we get a little bit of product announcement, maybe a little bit more direction. I'll try to log in on this day on October 11th and view this conference and absorb as much of it as I can and report report back to you when we have a show that week. Now, the FTC is seeking prior approval of Meta Platforms deals. It almost is like the FTC wants to be Meta's mom and dad when it comes to buying other Oculus or Metaverse companies. I think this is incredible overreach by the United States government. I might be in a minority opinion about that, but that's what this appears to be. Now, this obviously all relates to that within app maker acquisition that Meta made and is obviously being challenged by the FTC. We've got a court date likely towards the end of this year. I think in sometime in December, we'll get a court date on top of that. But also what the FTC is trying to get this judge to rule is that the FTC should get prior notice before Meta makes an acquisition. And then they basically, can say the basically allow basically like a parent allowing their minor to go out maybe and stay out late. They want that permission for Meta's acquisitions. I think this is crazy. But one thing that I will point out to you is I do occasionally publish articles on Seeking Alpha. It's not something I focus on a lot, but sometimes I get a little bored. I want to sit around and write instead of record videos and those types of things. Well, I actually wrote an article about this back in August on how the FTC could derail Meta Platform's big plans. It discussed some of these types of things. I have links to my Seeking Alpha profile down below. If you're willing to follow me on that platform, I'd love to see you over there. And you're more than welcome to message me or leave me comments over at Seeking Alpha as well. Moving on to Apple. Start of the week at 156. We obviously had that gigantic event where they announced the new iPhone 14. We'll talk about the watch here in a second. New updates to the AirPod Pros. In fact, the vast majority of the presentation, this was on Wednesday, focused primarily on the watch and the AirPod Pros. They gave a little bit of time 
We didn't get iPads. We didn't get any computer news. Uh, those typically happen a little bit later in the cycle. We'll have some computer news as it relates to Apple here in a second. But we did start the week at 156, essentially ended the week roughly flat up about 0.8% to $157 per share on Apple. Now, they showed off, as I aforementioned, the iPhone, the AirPod, the watch. And look, the pricing was the same. I was kind of hoping, just kind of as a greedy investor in Apple, that they would raise the price on these things. I think they have pricing power. We'll see some analyst comments when it comes to that. But I actually think the coolest thing that they did was now they have a good, better, and best model, essentially across their whole product line, but as it pertains to the watch. Because before, they had just the SE watch, which is kind of your good or your quote-unquote cheaper model. And then you had the Series 8 or the Series 7 in the past or whatever number you want to add onto it. That was basically the best watch you could buy. Well, now they have this Ultra Watch, which actually looks quite a bit bigger. And on the models that I saw it on the screen, it looked rather chunky, which is not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to a watch. But now you have this good, better, best model when it comes to pricing, when it comes to consumers making the choice of which model they want to buy, which model they see themselves fitting into. I love that with Apple. It completes that product line, in my opinion. Now, Apple rises as the iPhone 14 delivery estimates creep into October and other countries. This is significant because that October delivery date should put these phones, at least from a revenue perspective, on the most recent quarter. So quarter year over year comps over at Apple, some of the, even the revenue estimates that we have for the current quarter might be a little out of whack. Now I did pre-order my phone today. I should get my phone the first week of October. I don't know how a revenue perspective, how Apple is allowed to factor that in. If they're allowed to factor in the full price of the phone today, or do I physically have to take delivery of that phone for them to recognize? Those are all kind of CPA things to figure out. And it really, in the grand scheme of things doesn't really matter, but it could set up the fact that we have upcoming earnings with all these. All these companies are about 30 to call about 50 days away from announcing their earnings, and it could juice up the earnings over at Apple if they have those sales creep into this most recent quarter. Now, the Apple iPhone 14 is somehow going to be available in Russia thanks to the country's import scheme. Essentially, what they're going to allow to do is the trade and industry minister in Russia is saying if consumers want to buy these phones, they're going to be able to do that. They're going to be able to basically buy it from a third party. They're not necessarily going to buy these from Apple. It's basically going to go to maybe like a wholesaler or a distributor, and they're going to be able to get these into this country. In my opinion, this might not be a great opinion, but I think this is Russia trying to keep their citizens happy if they don't allow them to buy iPhones could complicate situations there in Russia. Now, Apple will gain market share by maintaining iPhone pricing. This is according to Loop Ventures. Obviously, I think we did a story uh, last week on the show. We talked about how half of America has an iPhone. And certainly as you start to look out into China as well, probably the, the second most important market for Apple, they are gaining market share, okay? They are slowly getting more and more people to, first of all, the people that already have an iPhone continue to rebuy another one. But also what you're seeing is, is likely, I think what you're having is younger consumers are coming of an age where they get to decide what kind of phone they want to buy. They are gravitating towards Apple. And then also you have other handset makers, maybe people switching from a Samsung or a Google. They try that phone out for a certain period of time. And then for, for whatever reason, they switch to Apple. We're seeing all of those trends go in Apple's direction and and Gene Munster, legendary analyst over at iPhone, thinks that, that that pricing strategy where they maintain the price, again, me, a greedy investor, was hoping they'd raise the price 10 to 20% on that base price. They didn't do that. In fact, the pricing is identical on the lower end of the phones. Now, if you're in Japan, if you're in another country, due to the stronger dollar, you are probably going to pay a higher price. But the constant currency price is basically the same. And in fact, here in the United States, the fact that the price has stayed the same actually is, is essentially a price cut when you factor in the rapid inflation that you've had here in the United States. In fact, the phone from a purchasing power perspective is actually cheaper year over year. Now, Apple is warning or was warned by GOP lawmakers that they better not get some chips. These are memory chips from a Chinese company. Now, this is a complicated story. I kind of read into this a little bit. The fact that these are not necessary 
necessarily these obviously we know Apple gets the actual semiconductor chips from TSM to make uh, basically every single one of their products. In fact, the new iPhone I think was going to be on four nanometer processor, which is a first, I believe, for the iPhone as well. These are actually memory chips, but these are phones meant to be sold into China. So I can understand lawmakers taking issue with Chinese made chips that are made in China and then brought here and they have some national security concerns. We're going to assume too, these lawmakers probably are privy a little bit more to some information that we might not be privy to as just average citizens. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt here, but these are actually phones that are going to have Chinese made chips, memory chips that are then going to be sold in China. Now, obviously they could make their way here to the United States somehow, some way, but we'll see how Apple responds to this. My guess is they'll figure out a way to uh, do that in an election year. Now, China will not invade Taiwan within the next five years, according to the Intel CEO, and I'd have to yield to other people on this subject. Now, we certainly talked about this. I had the chip show last weekend. We'll probably do a similar show this weekend in a different sector, but obviously Apple gets a ton of the, basically all of their chips from Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturer. So a lot of people bring up to me in the comments, they're like, well, you're a gigantic investor in Apple. In fact, it's my second largest holdings. And I talk about all this risk with TSM. Well, for me, I don't necessarily want to layer even more Taiwan risk onto my portfolio. I'm already taking that with Apple and that's how I choose to do it. I don't necessarily want to layer on Taiwan Semi. Well, with the Intel CEO saying uh, Taiwan not necessarily going to be invaded. And look, I've listened to political analysis of this and this is the general thought process that this is mostly saber rattling. But look, I've long gone out of the business of trying to predict what countries do and what politicians do. A lot of these people are, quite frankly, a little crazy. Now, Apple cuts shipment forecasts for their MacBook Pro computers. These are very expensive computers by up to 30%. I think so. now it's rare. In fact, an analyst says it's very infrequent for Apple to cut orders before they peak season. Again, kind of the back to school or back, you know, you went to school and then you get a new computer for Christmas or something. And it's very, very rare for them to cut the demand. I think some of the reasons why is last year's MacBook Pro, which I am recording this video on. And look, I have Photoshop running. I have Premiere Pro running. These are memory intensive programs. I have an Excel sheet running. I have my messages. I have multiple browser windows running and I'm recording this video in 5K and this computer doesn't miss a beat. This is such a gigantic leap over any computer that I've ever used that yes, the new MacBook Pros will be slightly better than this, but there's no reason for me to fork over another four to five thousand dollars for another one when this computer works so incredibly well. So yes, there'll be some users that haven't quite gotten up to the MacBook Pro level that will upgrade to the newest ones. But I think last year's upgrade cycle was so significant that users like me jumped in immediately when we were able to buy these types of computers and we're we're definitely pleased with them, but I have no reason to buy another one of these computers probably for at least another year. I think that has something to do with some of the demand slowdown. And also and on top of that, you had a lot of demand pull forward with the pandemic, the work from home, people upgraded their systems. A lot of companies gave out money to upgrade your systems at home. People are not necessarily upgrading those systems as quickly as they did in the past. Now, Apple is seeing a significant boost in its advertising business. This is interesting because they essentially cut off or put a big wrench in the Facebook advertising business. And here is Apple growing their ad business faster than competitors because they put such a gigantic wrench into this. This certainly could get antitrust or attention from lawmakers. My guess is the more it grows probably will. Whether or not that's a good argument, I'll let the lawmakers and lawyers decide that. Moving on to Amazon. Start of the week at 127. I was actually surprised. This one up quite a bit this week, up 4.9%. End of the week, closer to $133 per share. This is after Amazon bought a warehouse machinery robotics maker called Klusterman's. I, I don't know if I said that right, but the deal terms are undisclosed. So it's probably, you know, you're looking at probably a couple hundred million dollars for this type of thing. Now, Amazon has been using this company's technology since 2019 to help move heavy stacks of pallets and totes or packages together for customer orders. This also relates, you have this big, a gigantic unionization effort over at Amazon. All of those people that are former 
forming unions, you are going to be replaced by a robot at some point. So enjoy your union wages while they last. I'm not trying to say that to be a jerk. This is the investor channel. These are the facts. Now, CVS bought Signify Health for $30.50 per share. I'm seeing currently Signify Health trading in at $29.17. That's really close to the premium. So a lot of investors probably thinking that deal goes through and that expands CVS. The reason why I'm throwing this into Amazon is because it was Amazon that was rumored to also be a bidder in this. So this comes as maybe kind of a relief. I mean, I don't, I'm not here to decide how Amazon spends their money, but this would have been $8 billion. And we'll talk about another deal that they just did in the similar healthcare space for like two or $3 billion. They're spending lots of money. And then Andy Jassy, which is now the CEO of Amazon was at the code conference down. And I believe it was in Los Angeles. And he talked a lot about healthcare, how they're going to transform that space. Some of the ways they're going to do that is through acquisition. Obviously lawmakers are going to try to put a squash to that. I think it's interesting that we're seeing a consolidation in that space. And I'm really excited about what Amazon might have in store from that in terms of a revenue and a growth perspective. Now, Amazon, speaking of healthcare, is eyeing the Japan prescription drug market. Now, Amazon bought PillPack. This was many, many years ago. This allows you to buy uh, uh, drugs online, prescription drug, legal prescription, legal prescription drugs online. And my guess is they're probably taking that market share or that market over into Japan. Now, Amazon received FTC request for that one medical deal that we talked about here in a moment. Now, that deal was for $3.9 billion. Again, Amazon was trying to do another about $8 billion deal for Signify Health. So they're moving rapidly into this. And Amazon's not a company like Microsoft, like Google, like Apple that has hundreds, literally hundreds of billions of dollars in cash. This is not a company in that position. It also is not a company that produces a lot of positive cash flow at the moment and doesn't produce a lot of obviously positive net income or profits. So these are very very taxing on the stock. So they better work out very well. I have confidence in my opinion that Amazon will do that. Very much looking forward to see what they have in store for the healthcare space. Moving on to Netflix, start of the week at 222. Just shocked how well, the, I thought this one was going to break down. I'll show you in the technical segment. There was a time here, like on Wednesday or so, you had a big gap down on this stock, but it rebounded and ended the week up over 5% to $233 per share. This is after Amazon's, or excuse me, Netflix. Netflix ad sales potentially get an upbeat look from an analyst. They project that $3.6 billion in revenue from those ads projected in the United States and Canada by 2025. Look, $3.6 billion on a $101 billion company is actually pretty tangible and pretty significant. Moving on to NVIDIA, start of the week at 135, but boom, up 6.29% to 143. If you watched my chip analysis show, I have a very bearish view on this company and that could be wrong. Look, I could be wrong and I'll certainly be the first to come in here and tell you that, but I think there are going to be great opportunities to make me make money in the shorter term from NVIDIA. It's just not a long-term hold for me. And I'll, if you want an explanation on that, you can view the chip video that I posted. It'll be the last video that I posted before this one. Now, NVIDIA teased Project Beyond for new GPOs and Stifle, which is an analyst, saw 20% upside as it began covering now, this it, we should get further announcement. The CEO of NVIDIA said we should get, he basically just kind of teased this. He didn't really give much of anything, but he, they have this GTC conference that is set for September 20th, just like the meta conference on the metaverse next month in September. I'll make sure I have this on the calendar and I try to log in and at least see a replay of this, but I'll try to watch it live and again, bring you the news that I see from that. Moving on to Google, started at 107 and we got defensive at the that 110 level. I thought those buyers would defend that level and they did. Google up about 2.9% to $110 per share. This is after Google really tightening the belt over there. They are going to restrict travel to business critical needs. So if there is a way to virtually attend a meeting, that's what they want you to do. If you're an executive, I tell you what, if I was an executive at Google and I have full, I'm fully aware of the cash flows, the profits, and the amount of cash this company has on the balance sheet, 
sheet. I'm thinking, are they really skimping on a $700 flight to New York or something like that? But that is what Google is doing. The CEO of Google seems to me a very, very disciplined person, okay? You don't see Google making these big, gigantic acquisitions. You don't see them taking these large risks. In some cases, I really respect that. In some cases, I do actually wish they would take a little bit more risk. I think the more Sundar Pichai is on the job, maybe he starts to take a little bit more risk. But he is really, really tightening the belts. As he also hinted that job cuts may be needed for productivity gains, he's thinking that the Google needs to get about 20% more productive. And he thinks one way to do that is start firing people so the people that maintain their job feel like they need to work harder in order not to get fired. I respect that. Now, Google is sending out an invite for an October 6th event. They're expected to unveil the new Pixel 7 phone and a Pixel watch as well. We'll take a look at those products when they come out. Not a significant portion of Google's revenue, but certainly significant to a certain degree. Moving on to Microsoft, start of the week at 255, closer to 256. End of the week up nicely from a technical perspective. If you follow me on Instagram, again, links to all my social and all those things down below. Love to see you over there and really appreciate all the support that I get on those platforms as well along here on YouTube. Now, we finished the week at 264, but a beautiful technical pattern is setting up with Microsoft. I'll show you that from the technical segment of the show. Now, Australia's antitrust authority delays a ruling on Microsoft planned acquisition. Per Everybody's just delaying this. And it's conveniently, I don't know the election cycle in Australia, but it's convenient that everybody is just delaying this deal, which was really supposed to be, I think, approved by now. They're all delaying it, but ironically enough, till after the elections, because guess what Microsoft is going to have to do to all these politicians? They're going to have to fund them or not fund the opposition in a lot of cases as well. And they're just going to hold this over Microsoft head as we get into the elections. And then eventually, I think that deal gets approved. Now, the Microsoft CEO sells 19.55 million shares. Hello, Amy Hood, you want to invite me over? We'll spend some time on your yacht as you're $19.5 million richer. Now, this happens all the time. In fact, you had the CEO also sell about $14 million worth of shares on September 1st. Sometimes this is not a great sign. In this case, I don't think it's that big of a deal. You also might recall on my Microsoft video, I thought Amy Hood did just such a spectacular job over the last four quarters over at Microsoft. They literally had the cash flow, the positive cash flow be almost to the penny be subtracted off by things like buybacks, dividends, acquisitions. To the penny, she spent every last penny a positive cash flow. It is so impressive to do that. I try to do that as a personal finance, just managing my own finances. I try to have almost no inefficient use of my cash, especially in an inflationary environment and a low interest rate environment. It's to, for her to do that with hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, it's so impressive. I think she deserves, I rarely say this about executives, I think she deserves that $19.5 million and I hope her and family enjoys it. Now, Microsoft invested in Uber co-founders new venture called Cloud Kitchens. Now they say new venture. This is actually a pretty old, old in air quotes in the tech community, relatively old, but Cloud Kitchens was started by Travis Kalnick. As you would remember, he was originally one of the founders or the co-founders of Uber. He was booted out. He was, I guess, relatively controversial, but he started Cloud Kitchens, which is actually really interesting. I actually think it's a really cool business. And if I had more time and more reasons to start a business, I'd actually want to get into that space because what it allows you to do is to sell food onto the apps like a DoorDash, but I don't have the front of staff overhead that is required and also the overhead with running a physical restaurant. I just lease a space in a kitchen. I create a men some menu items and then I sell them on the food delivery services. I actually think that is a very, very cool business. Whether or not it turns out to be a great investment, I'm not exactly sure. Now, moving on to Tesla. Hello, Tesla, also from a technical perspective, looking spectacular, probably setting up towards the top of the range as we move into earnings. We'll talk about some of the reasons why, but we started the week at 270 and the week darn near at $300 per share. Tesla just holding up very beautifully over the last couple of weeks. Now, Tesla set new goals in Nevada's Gigafactory with a new boss in place. So you had a vice president leave. You have a new boss in place. What I love about Tesla is there's so much pressure to perform and perform 
perform efficiently at this company. That comes from the top, the top CEO position. We've seen this at Apple in the past. I think you're seeing it at Apple even today, but certainly with Steve Jobs, you saw this. This is why when you have iconic leadership at these companies, it can just drive so many results. Now, these gigafactories are making these power walls in these mega packs, and I won't get into it, but I was on Tesla's website trying to buy one of these power walls last night. Unfortunately, you have to have a solar install on top of that. But Elon Musk hinted that these power walls, which is essentially a backup battery for your house's power, and you use it, you can use it in a number of different ways, but primarily in tandem with solar power, you essentially feed your excess solar instead of feeding it into the grid, you feed it into a battery. So at nighttime, when my solar power does not work, I run off battery excess power that I generated during the day. It is, in my opinion, a product that essentially will pay for itself very quickly. I think the price on it was $12,000. In my opinion, you would get your payback on that in just a year or two, especially out here in California, where I'm literally dripping with sweat as it's over 100 degrees outside. Now, Tesla is looking to set up a lithium refinery in Texas. This is just kind of vertically integrating the supply chain. We've seen this over at Apple as well. They relied on Intel and other chip makers, and they still do. They still rely on Qualcomm and some other chip makers out there and certainly memory chip makers as well. But the uh, key processor chips inside of all Apple devices now all come from their own designs. Now, they're not manufacturing them themselves, but this is the area that Tesla could go into, okay? They could mine the lithium or they could refine the lithium in this case. And I, in my opinion, very good move for a company that has that excess cash to invest in those types of things. Now, Tesla tripled its deliveries in China in the month of August. They delivered over 76, nearly 77,000 cars. Now, that's up huge over previous months where they had uh, COVID shutdowns and things like that. Really what you want to do is look at year over year. So year over year, you grew that 73% year over year. You delivered just 44,000 cars last year, again, up to nearly 77,000 cars. This is why this stock goes up because Tesla basically telegraphs their earnings. And as long as you don't have any shutdowns in China, you'd start delivering 77,000 cars per month, which appears to be the run rate that they're on over at Tesla at this China factory. Yeah, they're going to print massive of massive revenue and massive profit in the upcoming earnings report. Now, Tesla further improves their delivery turnarounds in China, you think, when they're delivering these kind of numbers from the factory. Model 3 and Model Y vehicles have just a 6 to 10 week wait. Try to order one of these in the United States and 6 to 10 weeks is very, very nice. Now, moving over to the technical segment of the show, things are starting to look really sexy from a technical perspective. Now, I've got this purple lining here. Obviously, we had this monster rally. We gave it back over the last couple of weeks here in the stock market, but we had kind of a mini bounce this week. And what did we do? We had a lower set of lows here, higher set of lows, and we bounced off a higher set of lows. That's what this purple line is. This is a beautiful uptrend for me. Now, some of you might be wondering, do I think this is the bottom? And this is just going to be the, we're just going to keep making higher lows until we get to all time highs and a bust through that. I would say no. If you were to pin me to a decision today, if I'm going to go long or short this market, wouldn't necessarily do it right at this price. But the thing that we always have to factor in when we're doing technical analysis, First thing you could zoom out on the S&P 500 chart. This is basically a seven to eight year view. Okay, the longer term trend clearly basically skyrocketing upper. That's why we're trying to, we always err to, we're trying to buy the dips. We're trying to accumulate the stock market, essentially, because the longer term trend, I mean, we can go back to infinity with the S&P 500. I'm not breaking any news here. The longer term trend is up. That's why we're always looking for an excuse to buy these markets. Those of you that are mega bearish and think the world is going to end, believe me, I've been investing in 20 years. I've heard the doom and gloom, buy silver, buy gold, buried in the backyard for 20 years. These people are making a lot of money by selling that idea. If it happens, I don't want gold and silver. 
I don't want stocks. I don't even want cash. I want water and food and probably solar panels on my roof so I can at least uh, still have some evidence of power. The doom and gloom scenarios can play out, but from an investor perspective, I think a lot of investors pay way too much attention to it. But uh, my full point, I'm getting around to a point here, okay? Longer term uptrend with the S&P 500 is up. We're obviously trying to look for excuses to accumulate this, but the trend from the beginning of the year, the dominant trend is still down with this one. So if you were to ask ask me what is going to happen in the shorter term with the S&P 500 and most of these stocks is we're probably going to come up here and probably make a lower low. That is what we've been doing all year. I think we could maybe bounce up to 4,100, maybe as high as 4,200 before we read resistance. I still think, I still don't think this purple line is going to hold. I think we come back, we break through this purple line, but we should have areas of support down here south about 3,800 on the S&P 500. We retest these levels. It's not where I would go all in from a margin perspective, or if I only had $1,000 from now until the end of the year to invest in the stock market, I wouldn't put my whole $1,000 if we make a retracement back to these lows, but it would be areas where I would add you know, $100, you know, $80, $150 or something like that. You decide, you make those decisions. By me saying I've turned bullish and I'm accumulating stocks doesn't mean I think this is the bottom. Doesn't mean I think this is going to rocket to all-time highs. In fact, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that it will. Certainly it could but I don't think there's a lot of evidence that it will. I think we make a lower high here. We pull back. Maybe this purple line holds. Maybe it doesn't. I hope actually it doesn't. We retest these lows that we made back kind of in June here on the S&P 500 and you keep accumulating these markets. Again, the shorter term trend is still down. That is still the trend, but the longer term trend is up. And look, folks, if you can't buy the S&P 500 down 10, 15, 20%. If that doom and gloom scenario plays out and we put up big, gigantic red candles, if you're frozen right now, I get comments here on the channel. I think it's too early. I can't buy right here. If you can't buy here, you will not buy down here. Okay. Let alone if we have some cataclysmic event and we really get bad. If you can't buy 20% down, you are not going to buy 40% down. Period. End of story. That is how it's been for my entire 20 years of the stock market. You need to train yourself to buy the dips. It's not the bottom. It's probably not going to be the bottom. It's probably going to go lower, but that is not why you are buying the dips. You are buying the dips because you can buy 20% down. It will give you the courage to also buy 40% down. If you cannot buy 20% down, trust me, you will not buy the market when it's 40% down. Period. End of story. You will not be able to do that. So get your mind right and get focused on what matters. Now, in terms of Meta, this one has been just trading so beautiful. Everybody says, oh, you're so negative on Meta. I've made more money trading Meta than any other stock that I've had over the, all year, okay? And maybe over the last couple of years. This thing is traded so predictably over the last couple of months. We've made a series, not necessarily a beautiful series of higher lows, but it has been working like clockwork. When this stock got down to 157, look, this was last week. Okay, I bought this at 157. It popped up here to 166. I sold it. A couple days later, like on a Friday, it's actually this big red candle. I bought it here on Friday. Now, it went down Monday and Tuesday of this week. I didn't add to the position. I was just kind of waiting to see how it worked out. And then boom, we put up this big green candle. I didn't sell it at the top, but I sold it somewhere here, 165, 167. Again, I made another week after week. I'm making three to 5% on my money on Meta. I love this stock. I love this stock. I don't love the fundamentals. I'm not in love with the outlook. I'm not in love with the metaverse like some people are, but I love making money and you can make money in meta and that's what's happening. Now, in terms of the outlook, I think this one could, you know, really continue if the momentum stays in the market. This one's easily coming back up to 165, 170, 175. I think you will have resistance up here at 180 and probably again, come down here and retest a higher low. 
That's how I'm seeing that one. Moving on to Apple. This is one stock that maybe did bottom back in June. Okay, this one was down here at about $130 per share. I think I bought it just a tiny amount at about 137, 138, somewhere on these candles. I don't remember if it was on the way down or on the way up. So we're a little ways away from where I'd be excited on this one. First level, I like this one probably is at 150. It's really south of 150 where I would like to accumulate this one. I think you've got hard support for this one from a fundamental, from a valuation, but also from a buyback perspective. My guess is Apple is just buying, backing up the truck when it gets down here south of 140. That's also where I would want to buy Apple stock as well. Moving on to Amazon, this one's actually holding up a lot better. So I had this black line in yesterday, but look what we're kind of doing with Amazon. We're making a series of very steep higher lows on this one. Now, that usually means that that's not going to last and you're going to break through this. The first area of support that we have with Amazon. Again, these ha things haven't really changed. You're down here at about 119. South of 119 is where I'd be excited about Amazon. Now, if I had a thousand dollars that I wanted to put in Amazon and it got to 119, I might buy one share, might even buy a half a share at that point because the momentum over the shorter term here is down. Even the intermediate term is down on this stock. I'm expecting this one to continue continue down, but you should have pretty heavy demand for this stock under about one, really under 119, more specifically under 110. This is where I'd be far more aggressive. Okay. If I had a thousand dollars in this one, the minute it gets to like 109, 110, I'm probably buying two or three shares. If it keeps going down buy another two or three shares, if it keeps going down, gets into this green zone, then, you know, you're buying quite a bit of it. Again, if the fundamental story doesn't change too much. Now, moving on to Netflix, one of the reasons why I'm bullish on this market is stocks like this are holding up very well. Now, it is having trouble. I'll zoom this back out. You're, you're having trouble getting over this 240 level, and this is going to be a significant area of resistance on this stock. It acted as some support for the stock in the past. It was also the area where this stock gapped down after earnings. It basically took a quick pivot pick stop here at 240 and then it really got down and now we're going to have trouble in my opinion kind of busting through this wouldn't be an area where I'd be like mega excited about accumulating Netflix but this is an interesting pattern and I was actually surprised earlier this week it did break through the kind of this green channel line that we had I thought oh for sure we're coming back down to 200 on this one didn't get there that would be the first area where I would be excited about and Netflix is probably 200 really south of that maybe retesting this line although the longer time goes on, obviously these two lines will converge. Okay. You have your lower low line kind of converging with this other trend line. So the $200 area is probably my target on Netflix to the downside. I don't know what it's going to take to push over 240 on Netflix, maybe earnings coming up. Now, moving on to NVIDIA, I am incredibly bearish from a fundamental perspective. That might end up being the wrong call, but again, that is comparing the performance of NVIDIA to a zero earning asset like cash. Certainly, if you're going to put choose putting your money under a mattress or investing it in NVIDIA, I would probably say, well, you might as well take a shot and put your money into NVIDIA because putting your money under a mattress has a, a negative rate of return. But when it comes to investing in NVIDIA versus Google, NVIDIA versus Microsoft, certainly NVIDIA versus a Tesla or an Apple or an Amazon, well, now we're talking about a whole different story. So from a fundamental perspective, not really in love with this company. I think you will have some resistance here at 146 was an area of support. That will be resistance on the way back up. I think we're going to chop around in this box. Ultimately, I think it's the fundamental story plays out in NVIDIA and certainly the markets have another leg down from a valuation perspective and a forward revenue growth perspective. I think you're coming south of 100 on NVIDIA. That's just my opinion. I might end up being wrong on that one. Now, moving over to Google, just doing exactly what we thought it was from a technical perspective. You're making beautiful series of higher lows here. It really consolidated right here between, uh, you know, it got as low as about 105, 106 on this one, but it's consolidating at this area. If you believe these are higher lows and then it's going to continue and bounce and go to higher highs, certainly if the market maintains this momentum into next week. And certainly into earnings as well. We saw this with the last earnings cycle. 
most of these stocks actually set up towards the high. Now, Google was actually the opposite. Google actually set up kind of towards the bottom and then the revenue estimates and kind of the earnings and the guidance was actually really good. And it shot up to the top of the range only to get rejected back here. We could have a similar setup, which means we will just consolidate right here with Google for the next month. I have earnings estimate date on October 27th on this one. That's well over a month away. It could just consolidate in a tight range between call it as high as 112 and as low as 105. The other thing that could happen is investors kind of front run those earnings and this one sets up towards the top. We'll see this with Tesla here in a moment, but we set up towards the top. That also could be an area where you sell this stock if you're in it for the shorter term. But right now, Google trading rather predictably similar to a meta. Now, moving on to Microsoft. From a technical perspective, this is as pretty as it gets. I promise you folks, I did not move this purple line from last week's show because what we identified was, yes, this stock was in a, a steep downtrend. And you'll notice too, as well, we used to have this uh, kind of this channel line, but when you broke out of that, that's why I took that upper channel line away because what that signaled for me, first of all, it didn't signal for me that this channel is done with, but what it signaled for me in the shorter term was that channel actually was done with. And what we started to make since we broke out of this channel and then retraced, we have a low here back in June. We have a series of higher lows back in July. And now we're making higher lows here in August and September as this stock bounced perfectly off this purple line. Again, I did not move this purple line. This is why you don't necessarily see moving averages on my stock charts. You certainly can use those. Those certainly can help, but I don't think you need them. This stock bounced off there. I would expect if the market maintains its momentum, we're probably easily coming to 270, maybe as high as up to 279, potentially all the way up here to 295. It would be gorgeous if we make a higher high. What you're looking for with Microsoft is is not not in the next like month or the next couple of weeks but this is the formation that you would like to see with this one is that we move higher than 290 on this one didn't even have to get that high and then we have another pullback but then it creates another series of higher lows this would really confirm that the buyers are stepping in at a higher price on this one it's a very bullish reversal pattern at some point forming Microsoft either way I think you're accumulating this one there I mean there there is some sideways. I know I got a ton of lines on here and I apologize by next week's show. I'll, I'll try to clean these up, but you do have a lot of price action just over the last three or four months between about 240 up to about 265 on this one. That is where I would like to accumulate a Microsoft stock. Now, finally moving over to Tesla, it's doing probably the most interesting thing. Okay. You're making this big, you have this big gigantic up. You're making this big kind of flagging formation. What we are doing though, is we're setting up towards the top of the range. Okay. Since last year, last November, we've been making lower highs on this one, but it also has been coupled with a series of higher lows. So you're getting a coiling of price, typically, especially in a high momentum and a highly volatile stock like Tesla, you're going to likely see a pretty good break to either the upside because what's going to get exhausted here is either the sellers or the buyers. One of them is going to run out of money or will, and this thing's either going to go break higher or it's going to break lower. Not necessarily below the lows, but we do have earnings. I have an estimated date on October 19 on this one. That is a, just a shade over uh, probably about five weeks away on this one. You get a break lower on this one. You can buy this one south of 240. You get a break to the upside. You could potentially play the upside on this one as well. You get above this channel. Again, I would in the shorter term, I would set kind of stop loss. Let's assume like like Tesla like breaks up above this, maybe it gaps up or it, it just kind of moves up higher next week or over the next two weeks. And it gets up in here to about like 325, 330 range. Okay, that is kind of a breakout and you can play that trade, okay? You can set a stop loss at the previous highs right here at about 311, 310 or so, maybe even a little bit lower than that. Again, this is a high beta, high moving stock. You could probably have it right where the stock is right now at 300. And you play, because if you break out here and the sellers truly have dried up, can, again, when you break to the upside, it's, it's often a fake out. But if they've truly dried up, you are very likely coming over $400 per share on this one. Guys, that is like $80 upside and maybe $10 to $15 downside. That is 
pretty strong risk reward. That is how I would play that one for the shorter term. What I'm actually hoping for is Tesla breaks to the downside on this one and we can get this one south of 240 because my long-term outlook with this stock is that it continues to go higher, continues to grab market share, continues to grow profits, and continues to crush the quote-unquote competition, which is supposed to have had a lot of electric cars by now. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. Be safe this weekend. Stay cool if you're out here in California. Hopefully they keep our power on. Until next week, we'll see you again soon. Good luck with your investments.